Okay, well, I'd like to say thank you for uh, being here and, and welcome. As you all know, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has been an unprecedented event as far as uh, Canada and the countries in the world are concerned. And uh, the responses by the governments to uh, uh, COVID-19 has been unprecedented as well. And one of the consequences of that is a large number of people, at least that I've heard from, want to see an independent uh, national citizen-led inquiry into uh, what went right, what went wrong, and uh, most importantly for the future, what lessons can be learned from how this was uh, managed that would be uh, ensure better management in, in the future. So the purpose of this uh, conference is to this morning is to announce that uh, uh, an inquiry of that kind is being organized, national, independent, citizen-led uh, inquiry into Canada's response to COVID-19. The organization behind this at this stage is uh, uh, we've incorporated a, a not-for-profit company called uh, uh, Citizens uh, Inquiry Canada um, is a not-for-profit company that will receive donations to support. This effort's going to cost some money to receive the money and to spend it and to direct the operation at the beginning. There's also, and more importantly, a website's been set up, uh, nationalcitizensinquiry.ca, where people are being invited to a indicate their support that they want such an inquiry uh, secondly to suggest the names of commissioners that they would have confidence in because this inquiry would be uh, conducted by uh, commissioners and thirdly to donate if they wish because there's going to have to be some money uh, raised in this connection so, and the plan is to keep that website open for November and December to endeavor to get support for this concept of the inquiry and get these suggestions for commissioners, but to then hold public uh, hearings across the country in, uh, in starting in the new year. Uh, the initial idea is that there'd be uh, one in Atlantic Canada, probably centered in Moncton, uh, one in Quebec in Montreal, one in Ontario in uh, uh, Toronto, one in... Uh, in Manitoba, in Winnipeg, one in Red Deer for Saskatchewan, Alberta, one in Victoria for BC, and then concluding with a, a, a summary hearing in Ottawa. And the uh, the commissioners would be expected to produce a report uh, shortly after that. These hearings would be in-person hearings and, uh, and with opportunity for virtual participation as well. So that's uh, really the plan. And uh, the, uh, as I say, the purpose of this uh, news conference this morning is just to announce the organization of that inquiry and uh, to direct people particularly to that website because that's where the information will be on who is supporting this, uh, what are their suggestions for who they would trust as commissioners, and, uh, and uh, the progress of this thing will basically be recorded by uh, uh, viewing that website. So that's probably enough from me, but I'm happy to answer questions about this. Uh, uh, I, I should mention also that uh, in uh, mid-October, a public opinion survey was done that uh, indicated 74% of Canadians uh, felt that harm was done to them by the health protection measures uh, uh, adopted with respect to COVID-19. This is not harm from COVID. This is harm from the pro uh, protection measures. Th th those were in four categories, uh, harms to people's health, uh, people on the waiting lines, for example, people that uh, suffered uh, adverse effects from uh, uh, vaccines and so forth, uh, harms due to restrictions of rights and freedoms, uh, social harms, mainly due to social distancing and, uh, and, of course, economic harms due to the lockdown of the economy. And that uh, survey, uh, including regional breakdowns on it, is on that website as well for people that want to take a look at that. Anyway, that's enough from me. Yeah, a question. Yes, uh, right. From Les Coop de l'Information. Nice to see you again, Mr. Manning. Um, usually a public inquiry, the 
the strength of it is that they have a legislative power yeah. to yeah. Uh, compel uh, testimony to make sure that those who know actually give a testimony, which you wouldn't have with a citizen-led yes. yes. uh, commission. So how do you ensure the credibility of the process if you can't ensure that those who know will actually appear? No, that's a good question. We, we looked at that, of course, n normally on, on issues like this, like you're suggesting, the uh, inquiry would be held under the Public Inquiries Act, either the federal one or the provincial ones, where the commissioners would have the power to compel uh, witnesses to, the, uh, to uh, uh, appear. And this inquiry doesn't have that. Now, the, the reason for doing this as a citizen-led inquiry is because so many people are suspicious that if the government commissions an inquiry to look into how the government handled things, that that would be biased. Uh, so the uh, idea was to try to make this thing a citizen-led inquiry. It will not have the powers to compel uh, witnesses to appear, although it can invite them to appear and publicly invite them to appear. And when they say they won't, if that's what they say, it does raise the question, how come? What have you got to hide? But that is one of the, uh, the challenges of holding this uh, inquiry as basically a citizen-led one, not a government-sanctioned one. But but again, I ask my question. So uh, don't you open the door of people criticizing that initiative as being uh, something like which will be led by conspiracy theories and people, you know, have this uh, aversion of institution, etc. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. And there'll be those accusations. But the, the way to answer that question is not like academically for me to say, no, it's not going to happen that way. The, the thing is to actually see the hearing and see and then make a judgment after the hearing after you've seen who the testimony is from uh, the cross-examination and uh, the intent is to have uh, people uh, testify as to the impacts of this uh, the COVID protection measures at these hearings and anyone that testifies even if someone wants to testify that this group's information is misinformation, but they'll have to testify under oath. There'll be a commissioner of oath asking that what you say is that you swear that it's the truth, not just the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And secondly, you will be subject to cross-examination by somebody who probably knows more about this than you or me. So that these are a couple of measures to try to get the ensure the integrity of this process. But in the end of the day, people have to judge, is this a fair uh, objective exercise or is it skewed one way or the other? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was looking Hi, Mr. Way. Manning. Stephanie yeah. Levitz of the Toronto Star. Who will get to decide who the commissioners are? That would be a lot of power. I mean, I understand that people get to recommend who they'd like, but who's the person who ultimately gets to decide who the... Well, right, right now, this the, the organization behind this is this Canada, uh, this National Inquiry Canada, which is this uh, federal not-for-profit corporation with three directors of which I, I am one. But the, the hope is to add to this group that will organize this thing so it's broader and more, more representative than us. But that, that group will decide. But they'll have to base it on what people themselves say is who, who would they trust to do this. And uh, at this stage, we don't know who what those suggestions will be. At, the, at this point, some people have suggested what you want is, is ob the most objective people you can get, like a retired judge or somebody. Uh, others have suggested, this is typical of Canada, uh, know you, what you want is expertise on that panel. You want a medical person, you want a civil rights person, you want an economist and so forth. I think what may end up is a combination of those, probably with a chief commissioner whose main characteristic is objectivity and so forth, but others on that panel that have that expertise. And then, as I said to the earlier question, people will just have to judge, is this a legitimate panel in which they have confidence? If they don't, then they won't pay attention to it. If they do, then they will. This seems um, a few months back now. You were you were talking, if I recall correctly, about the need for a citizens' commission in general, about the government, about how our country functions. That and that sort of followed through a few years prior. You were talking about how the country needs a pop off valve for all the populist anger that is out there right now. And I mean, do you fundamentally think that something is broken in our existing institutions right now that we people well, no that, longer have faith? that's a broader faith? question, but I'd be happy to answer on some other occasion. I don't want to, this is not so much connected to that. Or, or this inquiry is an inquiry into one particular response 
by governments to a particular crisis. Uh, I, I, I'd be happy on another occasion to get into the broader subject of the need for reform, but I think you've heard me on that subject before. But this is a sort of a narrower inquiry just into the responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. Manning, okay. Stephanie Taylor with the Canadian Press. Yep. Who are the must-haves in terms of witnesses that would testify at this? I understand it sounds like this is very early stage. We're just putting things together. But if you can't compel people to come and, and testify or to speak to some of the decisions made at the inquiry, it raises some questions about the process. So in your mind, who would this inquiry have to hear from? Well, the, 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 I think the largest group is people who were impacted by these measures. What this public opinion survey shows that 74 percent of Canadians said they were injured, they were harmed by the health protection measures to cope with COVID-19. So people to testify as to what were those harms, uh, what were the effects on their, the adverse effects on their health, what were the effects on rights and freedoms, what was the effect on their, their, their social well-being, what were the effects on their economic well-being. I would expect a fair amount of the testimony be from those people, and they'll be subject to cross-examination too, so you don't just take the uh, comments at face value. I, I think a second type of, uh, of uh, witness will be scientists and medical people who have an alternative, negative, uh, an alternative narrative to the one that was put forward by the government. There's a lot of those people. And then the third category, which I think you're getting at, it would be nice to get a response from some of the government people and officials themselves. They, you can't compel those people to uh, participate, but you can invite them. And it was maybe encouraging the other day that uh, Dr. Tam said that the government would welcome an inquiry into how this was done. So maybe there'll be a more positive response there than, than we expect. I want to... The federal conservatives uh, under the new leader have focused a lot on the cost of living, a lot on affordability, um, some concerns about the Arrive Can app, about the IRGC, but in terms of the effects of COVID mandates and some of the civil rights concerns that people uh, have expressed, they haven't, to my knowledge, been um, super vocal as of late on those issues. What do you what do you make of that? Should this be something the federal conservatives take on on champion? Well, champion? We're, we're we're trying to uh, make this less political, less partisan political than you know. What does one party think, or what does one party do? And partly because again, the suspicion from the public, if the if the government took the initiative on this, if the liberal government took the initiative, people would say this will be a whitewash. If, if the opposition gets too militant on it, they'll say, well, this is a witch hunt. So it, it's best to keep the parties not directly involved. I mean, they can choose to be or not, but it's best to keep them not. And, and to, hopefully the representation on that website will be cross-partisan, not particularly skewed one way or the other. And, and again, like we could discuss this uh, academically and theoretically today, uh, at the end of the day, people are going to have to look at these hearings and make a judgment. Is this objective? Was this a worthwhile effort? Or was it skewed one way politically or skewed another way from the standpoint of interest groups? Hi there. Uh, Matthew Hoare from the Western Standard. Good to see you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned briefly that there would be talk about uh, adverse reactions of vaccines. Uh, I've certainly heard from a lot of Canadians that have experienced that, but there hasn't been much attention given to it. Uh, could you provide more details on what exactly you'd like to see? Uh, would these be individual Canadians harmed by vaccines testifying? Would these be groups on behalf of them? What, what sort of details can you provide on that? Well, one thing in the, on this website, one of the background items is that there was a group in Toronto in June that conducted a, a sort of a test hearing. What would happen if you had public hearings for three days? They, they had 60 different uh, people testify, most of them for 10 minutes on what the effects were on them. Th 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 those testimonies covered a, quite a range. It wasn't just negative health impacts. It was the rights and freedoms, the social, um, economic. But the ones that did testify on the health impacts, there were two categories. W one was from people that felt that the the lengthening of the waiting lines were people suffering from something other than COVID. Uh, people that had people die on the waiting lines because of our incapacity of our system to handle 
a, a surge in demand, that that was a negative health impact as a result of the, the COVID restrictions. And then others were on the subject of adverse effects from the uh, vaccines. But I, I would think from, from what we've seen thus far, those are probably the two types of testimonies with respect to health impacts. And we'll see what they are. Mm. Would you have any Canadians testify who have relatives or friends that passed away from vaccines? There's one gentleman in particular, his son, uh, Sean Hartman, uh, passed away a couple of days after getting the vaccine. He got it in order to play hockey, and he's been quite uh, outspoken on social media well, about the, that. Well, these people be entitled to, uh, our intent is not to sort of try to, for, first of all, to see who, who is willing to testify on this sort of thing and, and about what. But I would expect there would be people that would testify along those uh, along those lines. And the only caution I give to anybody that wants to testify on this is, A, you'll be asked to affirm that what you're saying is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, uh, which we never had to take that oath in Parliament, but uh, this is another subject. And, and, uh, and secondly, that you will be subject to cross-examination. It won't just be accepted. You'll be asked by somebody that's very knowledgeable about your testimony. But uh, hopefully people with these stories will come forward. They certainly did at this Toronto uh, thing and and the and the videos of those uh, the hearings are available on this as background material on this website. Yeah. Me again. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that there were three directors of your uh, entity. Yeah. What are the two others? Who uh, are? Uh, they're they're listed on that website. Yeah, but they're Doctor or Mr. David Ross, who's a chartered accountant in uh, in New Brunswick, and also has quite a reputation for. Uh, uh, ethics in the accounting business, and uh, uh, an, an Ottawa lawyer here who did the legal work of putting this thing together, uh, Andre Litvinenko. Okay. And the names are on the. Uh, Good. I'll, uh, I'll check. There's a brief bio on each of us. Yeah. And the other question I wanted to ask: um, I don't think we're talking right now of, of having a real public, uh, like an official public inquiry yeah. about this. But if it were to happen, uh, do you think it would be a good replacement of your citizen-led initiative, or you think that both could uh, live side by side? Well, I think this citizens one would be a good test case to see what would actually happen if you tried to have this inquiry. If the government were to commission, it'd have the same you know, skepticism that some of you might express with respect to this one. How objective would it be? Governments investigating themselves, particularly on something like that, would, would that be objective? Would the public say, no, this thing is skewed? There's a real challenge, no matter who does this, to get credibility and and uh, we feel the starting point for that is to ask people themselves, who would you trust to do this, you know, and go with those recommendations. So you think two, the two can co coexist? I, I, I would think this one would proceed. I would think the politicians will watch this one, particularly if it can be done fairly quickly, to see what happens, what comes out. And then that might condition their decision as to whether you have one or, or not. What do you think you would learn from an inquiry like this? Because a lot of these stories of people's uh, feelings about the pandemic restrictions, feeling about the vaccine experiences with the combination of thereof, they're already out there. You yourself cited a public opinion survey where, uh, you know, people's trust in how the yeah, pandemic yeah. was handled was low. So what new thing would you learn from uh, allowing this kind of airing of grievances, if well, you will? Well, like, I don't want to prejudge the outcome of this, but if I was one of those commissioners, I would listen to these stories. But the, the last question I would ask a witness is, OK, what would you recommend as to how this could be done differently so that the harm that you've talked to us about wouldn't have occurred? And to try to get on to not just what went wrong, but what can be done differently. And, and that might be the most useful outcome uh, from this. And, and you, then you will get into some of the suggestions that have been made already. Was it the wisest thing to hand the management of this over to the healthcare bureaucracies? When one of the conclusions from the SARS pandemic was that our bureaucracies are not the right people to handle emergency, is that so? So what's the alternative? Uh, what you might get is some of these alternative narratives from the science and uh, and medical community who who argue that the the idea that there's a single scientific narrative with respect to anything is not scientific. Science involves competing hypotheses. So you might you might get that kind of output and that would be useful it's going beyond just what went wrong and, and what were the harms but what can be done to try to manage this stuff better in the future 
Uh, just two other questions for me. Who's going to pay for this? Well, <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> we, we've got a, a donate button on this website, and, and hopefully, and we'll, we'll say to people, it's all very well to click on here and say you want this hearing, but somebody's got to put up the, the money. Uh, one of the hopes is to get a lot of donations in kind, like just the facilities to hold the hearing in a certain town. Is Will somebody put that up so that we don't have to pay for it? But th that's going to be quite a crucial thing. And, and at this stage, there's this not-for-profit company set up to collect the money and to spend the money. And we'll just ha have to see whether there's enough financial support to really make it, it work. Okay, that, that brings another a bunch of other questions to my head. But um, have you, I mean, you talked about hoping that this would supersede or, or yeah, supersede anything that the government might choose to do on its own. Have you gone to the government, anyone in the Liberal government or the opposition parties and said, what do you think of this? Do you support it? Um, and no, would you no, back I, it? I haven't, but of course there have been demands from other people or uh, suggesting that this should be done. And so far, at least as I understand it, the government has been pretty cool towards it. And, and for the obvious reason, th this is an investigation into something that they themselves did at a profound level. This is an unprecedented uh, intervention. So uh, uh, I, I think the impression that's been given so far uh, is that the government is reluctant to have this done. Or if it were to do it, it would be skewed in a certain way. M maybe the most uh, uh, recent and most welcome thing was that Dr. Tam did, I, and some of you I think maybe covered that uh, her, her comments, she did say that uh, there's, there, they would welcome an inqu uh, inquiry. It was quite vague, but so maybe the government would be um, supportive. I don't know. Okay, have we co co covered the field? Yeah, <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Questions. And say, really, that website is the source of uh, ongoing information on on uh, on this uh, this uh, national citizen-led uh, inquiry into the response to COVID nineteen. So thank you very much.